Refereeing controversy was firmly at the centre of round two of the 2024 Six Nations. Joining myself and the columnist today to discuss all of that controversy is former British and Irish Lion and England back rower Peter Winsbottom. Our predictions were more successful this weekend, but that doesn't mean that we saw a lot of Saturday's events in particular coming. Uh, refereeing controversy shrouded Scotland-France, which was a pretty non-game until the last, well, 10 seconds of actual time and the five minutes that followed it. And then controversy also in the England-Wales game. And we'll be sure to get into the nitty-gritty of that today. Joining myself and the full house of columnists to do so, is English and British and Irish Lion flanker and Isha director rugby, Peter Winterbottom. How are you, Peter? Very well, thanks. Very well. Yes. Good. Is Good. John Inverdale paying you enough? Uh, I would like to say no. <laughs> no. It's, uh, I don't do it for the money, obviously. Um, it's a lot well, of... <laughs> not if he's paying, that's for sure. <laughs> well, exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess John Inverdale's never coming on the podcast then. Well done, Chewy. Oh. <laughs> oh, he would do. He definitely would do if you asked him. Oh, he would. He he uh, would. No, actually, to be fair, you're probably right. Um, how are things with Isha? Obviously, topsy turvy, but you're sitting atop nap uh, nap to southeast, so all going pretty well this year. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes. I mean, it's it's um, it's it's been going okay. Um, you know, we've got a good bunch of blokes, um, some decent players. And um, you know, and, and a relatively strong squad for for that league. So you know, we've had a few injuries like everybody else, and uh, we we sort of still holding it together. Um, and other other teams are having a, a bit of a hard time of it. But um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, enjoyable. We're playing some decent rugby, scoring a few tries, and uh, and enjoying ourselves. So let's hope it keeps going. With the added advantage of not having to do anything with the TMO. Mm-hmm. No, we didn't. We don't have a team. Um, you know, I mean, I wouldn't say that the the re the standard of refereeing is is the the top end in, in our league, but um, you know, at least the guys turn up and uh, do a half decent job. And um, so, uh, yeah, but there's no not too much controversy. I've got to say. On balance, Wince, are you very happy not to have the T a, a TMO involved most of the time, or what? <laughs> you know, I I I think that. Um, I personally think the TMO is is a good thing. I, I do find it rather frustrating when some people who are TMOs seem to see things very much differently from uh, from the vast majority. Um, but it's a difficult job, and um, I guess they do it to the best of their ability. But you know, maybe we should look at uh, you know people who are who are consistently you know make make good decisions um that, that those are the ones who need to be uh to be in place with the big games i mean it's uh you know it's a bit farcical isn't it really but maybe we should go back to the old days where you know starmer smith would say well you know the referees are a lot closer than we are when we can see that it was a, a two yard forward pass and uh you know 70 people thousand people in the stand saw it and a couple of million on tv the only person that missed it was the referee. Um, you can be too close, can't you, Winters? That's the point about refereeing. Sometimes you're so close you can't see what's going on. Well, maybe that's the case, yeah. Yeah, it was quite interesting actually talking about referees. Um, my wife is a New Zealander and um, she met Wayne Barnes a couple of weeks ago for the first time. That was an in interesting conversation. Was she very polite to him? She was, Yes. And she did say what a really nice chap he is. And she yeah, was bit, however, comma. I can feel the however coming pissed, along. She was a bit pissed off that she actually find him found him such a nice bloke. <laughs> <laughs> that must be really, really annoying. Is he, is he, is he? Uh, it's the old saying, never meet your anti-heroes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, look, let's jump into the sort of we've touched upon the TMO already, the technicalities of that TMO decision. Um Brendan, your steam was coming out of your, your ears off air. So I am going to hand over to you purely because actually that decision went against your predictions favour. So yeah, it, it robbed me of an absolute belting prediction. Um, listen, the, the, the thing about TMO in rugby, um, for me, people compare it to cricket. It's very different from cricket and the, the um, DRS system. And the thing in cricket is the umpire gives you out. 
you're out. And it's the player, the player who appeals and invokes what we would call the TMO process. You know, I didn't hit that, or I did hit that, or that's pitching outside a leg. So he is challenging the umpire. Now, you can't have that too often. The umpire has to keep his authority within the game. But So they get three challenges in an innings. And, of course, they keep them, don't they, if they are a successful challenge. Now, in rugby, when the TMO is invoked, it's because the ref doesn't know. It's because he can't really make his mind up. He's not sure. The players have no say in it. I mean, I know they chopsy and they'll say, you know, go up to TMO, but they actually have no say in it. So it's either invoked because the referee doesn't know or the TMO doesn't know. So this, first of all, the absolute basic thing is you, you do not have decision on the field. That's irrelevant. Just bin it. It doesn't matter. You're going to the TMO to find out what happened. But the, the system we've got at the moment is there's a waiting given to the decision on the field. And that sort of really hampers you when you're trying to get to the truth. So that, that first of all, that whole scenario has got to be dealt with. We can't have that anymore. And we used to have try, no try, didn't we? First 10 years of TMO, it was try, no try. And then on this one, um, so, so he calls it the TMO. So he, his original decision is no try, held up. But, but he's not sure. He doesn't know. So he calls in the TMO. Already, the decision is prejudiced because he said it's no try. We look at it. I reckon it's pretty clear. It's about 97, 98% clear that it's a try. Now, you, you can't say it's 100% clear. And the way the system is set up is that they probably aren't going to give it now unless it's 100% clear. But even that is a nonsense because almost no try is 100% clear. We had a forward pass for England with the Dingwall try. It wasn't even queried on Saturday. We had Van der Merwe's try, first try last week. Not even remotely a try. It was a two-yard forward pass. So that's a very high bar to expect when you're looking at the TMO footage that it has to be 100% clear. And the reason they're doing that is this nonsense about having this call on the field. They've got to cut that out. Let the TMO decide it or let the footage decide. And the referee can take the lead. He doesn't. They can review it together and he can still retain his authority by making the call. But that's exactly what happened. They reviewed yeah, it. Yeah, together. but, yeah, but don't prejudge. Don't, but, yeah, no, but it was probably yeah, making exactly what call. didn't happen, Nick. And it's exactly what didn't happen. It, because the decision already been made, He McNeese reminded him that you have to be absolutely sure to turn it over. And in the end, they bottled it. They sure did. But... Um... Ah, look, I mean, one of the things about it is, I mean, I, I'm going to bring in a sort of um, a, an oblique angle here. I hate these sort of, you know, two inch bloke bloody well drops to his knees, propels himself over the line from, you know, by inches. I mean, it's sort of they're the worst tries in the game, you know, that sort of a try. And I, I in a way, I, I think that it's a sort of... Um, uh, it, it's poetic justice in a sense when they're in, in in a way when they're not given there was nothing in that where you're probably right you know probably 90 percent you'd say that looking at the eventual grounding which took a bloody age at the eventual grounding he probably got it but there was nothing that i could see of you couldn't even see skinner who's the bloke who scored it you couldn't see his head you couldn't see anything to do with him. I couldn't see his body. I couldn't see his hands. I did see a Frenchman's arm in a sort of uh, almost like an arm wrestle position and so on and so forth. I don't know whether Skinner grounded it and nor did they. Um, the likelihood is, is that he probably did, did the balance of probabilities. But, you know, what infuriates me about it is, is that rugby has invested in technology, but it hasn't gone, you, you either go the whole hog with this stuff or you don't. Now, chip technology, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you can, you know, differentiate between one arm from one team and another arm from another team in terms of who's grounded it with chip technology. I don't know if there's a way. But what I, what I do know is, is that they haven't got enough camera angles. You look at American football and they've got so many camera angles that usually, and they find them incredibly quickly as well. They're all on Taylor Swift. They get, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that too. That's the other 200 cameras. <laughs> but, but 
they've got so many bloody camera angles and their process by comparisons with with rugby rugby seems to be in terms of its sort of tv technology seems to be in the bloody dinosaur age yeah yeah yeah, yeah. One thing, so Peter, you mentioned that you're obviously very pro TMO, and it was interesting seeing sort of Brian McNeese's thought process in terms of making that decision because he sort of seemed to play his own devil's advocate in that he initially said, This looks to me like a try. <laughs> then as soon as you, said you can give about, the try, Nick, you Nick, can give the try. Yeah, so. then Nick Berry goes to give the try, and he's like, Hang on, Nick, actually, let's go back and, and, <laughs> and takes Nick Berry through the disallow process, which it ended up obviously being. Jonathan Davis, um, the the Jiffy version, not the uh, the younger version, has said, anonymize the TMO. And you just wonder whether there was a little sort of devil on Brian McNeese's shoulder saying, your, your, ne your name is being pinned to this decision. Go through every possible thought process there is. If he's anonymous, the backlash, which in Whistleblower, the Whistleblower documentary, for example, every referee speaks about, is eliminated somewhat. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, absolutely. I, I think um, I, I do agree with the fact that why should the referee um, make an on-field decision um, or, or basically the on-field decision from Nick Berry was that it was a, that it wasn't a try, and that was relayed to the TMO before the TMO looked at the the footage, which I don't I don't particularly agree with because the TMO has got to make up his own mind. I mean. In this instance, I believe that the TMO said uh, at one stage in the conversation that the ball had 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 been grounded, um, and then he changed his mind. Um, whether that was because Nick Berry thought it hadn't, um, and the TMO went with him, I, I don't know. But it, I do agree with um, with Nick in so much that you know if you know for the big games for the for the test matches. Um, you know, you, 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 you it, there is technology out there that could, um, uh, you know, you could make it far more um, uh, understandable that you know that it is a try or not, or not, not a try, and and that that technology should be brought into the game because um, you know at the moment we're a bit like sort of football, aren't we, where we're we're all arguing over a, a decision um, when really the game needs to. You know, we, we don't need to spend four minutes looking at a, at a try and then disallow it. And that's the end of the game. I mean, it's a com complete letdown to everybody. You know, we need to speed the game up rather than try and slow it down. So any 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 technology that can speed up a, um, a decision is is welcome. But what about making the TMO anonymous? I, I Yes. I mean, why not? Yeah. I mean... I I don't care either way. Um, you know, I mean, maybe you should say he's got to be accountable for what he what he what he decides. But I suppose he is. So we don't particularly need to know who he is. Yeah. Although that's quite difficult in practical terms, isn't it? Because I think we know we need to hear the dialogue. I mean, I think the the spectators are owed that. And then once you hear the voice, you pretty soon start putting a name to a voice. So if you're going to have an anonymous TMO, you actually you don't hear any of the conversation between ref. And TMO, and that and that you have to do like what they do in the. You have to do what they do in the sort of criminal, criminal. <laughs> oh, in camera. Overdub is <laughs> yeah, use a different a voice change or something like that. No, well, I I do get that, but I think, <laughs> I I I think there's not enough unless you I suppose unless you re sort of reshape the entirety of the TMO, it wouldn't necessarily work, and there would have to be some sort of transition phase. It's interesting that you mentioned. Um, football pizza because obviously I suppose the main difference between VMR, VAR and TMO in this instance is that football doesn't leave much grounds for debating whether the ball has crossed the goal line or not you know they literally go There's to a lot, of debates, a, lot of, uh, a lot of debates about offsides and, and fouls yeah offsides uh, and fouls is obviously yeah. very very different and, and they find it very difficult to accept uh, decisions um you know, I think I think gen, you know generally in, in rugby in the past, um, people have just accepted the decision to move on. Um, you know, and uh, that's ultimately what what everybody's got to do. But you've got to do that with a sort of modicum of, you know, um, of of knowledge that the the right you know or very nearly the right decision is has been made. I mean, you could go back to the World Cup final and talk about you know decisions to send off. Um, uh, Sam Kane, um, 
you know, and there were arguments why you shouldn't send him off and arguments why you should. And um, ultimately, the, the sort of game was let down by the fact that that he was sent off. So, you know, very important decisions have, have to be made. And um, and it's it's a difficult one. We, we we all have to eventually accept accept them. But as, as Nick said, you know, the, the technology is there. Let's we've got to use it. There'll always be. I think the thing about it is, is that whatever whatever you've got, there's always human error is always going to creep into it, and that's where the game has got to um, acknowledge, you know, acknowledge that human beings are fallible. But it's important to have the technology as good as possible to make sure that as much of that fall fallibility is ruled out. One of the things that really intrigues me about the TMO, though, because you know, there's quite a campaign, obviously, to ditch the TMO completely. And I think Chris was talking about that um, uh, beforehand. But I think one of the things that intrigues me is the number of um, TMO decisions on on groundings that are actually correct. You know, the number of times that we see uh, tries scored, particularly diving tries and so on and so forth, where you think that the ball's actually being grounded. But you see the slow motion replay, and there's, you know, it's bobbled or or what or whatever. So there's an awful lot that's actually picked up that, um, you know, that's that's good. But I mean, on on the flip side, one of the worst is forward passes. I mean, it seems to me that the, you know, the modern breed of international referee and referees down the uh, down the line too are making the big mistake because we all want continuity and speed and so on and so forth of allowing forward passes. You know, I mean, the, the number of decisions that are got that that are wrong in games, and everybody's up in arms over, you know, over a bloke who's trying to sort of wriggle his way over from bloody two inches, and you know the the. The, the, you know, the number of forward pass tries that are given is nobody's business. Totally. All, all the calibration seems to go out of the window. Like you say, <laughs> um, a try can be, come down to whether you graze the touchline with your boot or whether you're half an inch to reach the line. A forward pass is normally three, four, five feet forward, sometimes two metres forward. And that is just waved. Well, that is just ridiculous. Yeah. If you're going to be so pedantic about other things, you have to tighten up on that. And a lot of these tries, there's no reason for these forward passes. It's a two-on-one. Yeah. They're open. They're about to score. All they have to do is for the receiver to stand off two metres. It's going to run flat. And it's a walk-in. Yeah. And they're so used. They're so coached to this well, pass, getting away with it. That they just well, do it. That's where chip technology, if there is one area where chip technology really could come in, it's on the forward pass. Well, I think they've been that yeah. because they tried it in the World Junior, Junior World Cup. And the chip technology showed that the chip technology is just oh, yeah. <laughs> the other technology is let Brenda down. I think Brenda was about to say that the Brenda, I, you cut off. I'm guessing you're about to say yeah, that the it... Junior World Cup last year they 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 used it. they had the chip technology in in the, the kick in. Yeah, they tried to, but for so the two and Angie eight mm -hmm. Yeah, but so many of the passes were forward. I think they stopped using it. They just used it for the kicks. Can you have tick chip technology for not straights in the scrum? We you're don't need it. I don't, <laughs> think you need, I don't think you need that, to be honest. You're allowed to feed it now, aren't you? Are you allowed to feed it yeah. now? Yeah, and yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and I, think a, I think there's also a tacit... I mean, that is a, that is a formal situation. No, um, I, I also think there's a, a de, there's a tacit agreement, and it, and it, it 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 probably might have been spoken in any formal sense. But I I don't think they're worried about marginal forward passes anymore. They no. fall back on the excuse that it was backwards coming out of the hands. I still don't know how that works. I I understand the physics that says a long floated pass will have enough momentum behind for for, for the receiver to collect the ball in front of the passer. I get that. But a hell of a lot of these forward, uh, of, of forward passes that I see are travelling a, a couple of feet. Yeah, but, but even well, that is nonsense, Chris. Well, 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 well that, Finn Russell is the best. The passer. physics doesn't work for that. Well, stuff. when he does a long pass, he aims it back three meters. So even when it goes forward, it's still flat with him. That's called skill. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, we're talking about Barry John and the indeed. Lions. Watch the seventy-one footage. They all pass it back about four or five meters quite quickly, so that actually the ball oh. only goes forward about two meters. You know. Without yeah. a bank. We, I, I, I agree. I, mean, I, 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 I wouldn't have, have anonymized the TMO. 
um, not the bloke on Saturday. Anyway, I'd have vaporized him instead. I mean, the <laughs> bloke was I mean, it was unbelievable. He gave the try and then ungave it. Yeah. He said, I see the ball on the floor. I've got the ball on the floor. And Nick Berry, or Nick Beret, as he is now known um, to every French supporter, Nick Beret <laughs> then said, does that mean you want me that I'm changing my decision? To which the TMO said yes. Yeah. And he's about to do it. And Andrew Cotter's getting very excited in the commentary box because his own team are winning. Well, they're going to give it, you know, blah, all that stuff. And then he decides, oh, cranky, this is quite a big call. Let's just go back on this one a bit. It was a complete false breakfast. And it was an embarrassment. It an was. Embarrassment. And that's not to say there aren't good TMOs out there. Um, I, I've, I've seen tries given on that kind of evidence. The ball was the ball was clearly on the floor. The real, I, 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 mean, I accept Nick that you couldn't see much of Skinner. That's because the aforementioned Posolo to Alangi had fallen on top of him. You can't see anything if he's on top of him. <laughs> but he's, it, it but the but the ball patently you could see Skinner's hand on the ball when it was on the boot, mm. and, the, and the ball then moved to the floor, and that was quite clear. That but, was but you couldn't see his hand on it at that well, point. Oh, you might not be. So <laughs> once, once you're asking the bloke, once you're asking the TMO... I think he was down with pressure from his once, stomach. Once you're instruct, instructing a TMO that we must have conclusive evidence, then you're into definitions of what yeah. conclusive evidence is. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's another dog's breakfast in waiting. The so real, uh, real, I agree with Brendan completely. This whole cricket-style on-field decision, which then has to be verified or or... Or, or or countermanded by the TMO on conclusive evidence in a situation where there ain't any science or there's not any technology that's going to give you conclusive evidence because there's 400 tons of rugby player all around yeah. here. Yeah. The real, so it's, it's a dumb it's a dumb system. The real the real issue is is that what we're getting is less rugby and much more messing around with referrals, etc. Players. You know, players trying to influence decisions, a hell of a lot of time in between lineouts and scrums. It's 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 becoming a sort of it. It's almost becoming like you know they may as well fit ads in like they do in American football. Yeah, well, I, 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 I was going to waffle a little game. bit about that on 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 Sunday. I mean, however bad rugby is, it's still it's still bloody quicker than America than American football. Yeah. <laughs> Craig Craig Doyle, our 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 long term rugby host. Said he was upgraded to the Super Bowl for Sunday. He he said the halftime. So it's an it's an eleven thirty p.m. kickoff, and Craig Doyle said the halftime entertainment should be on at between one a.m. and one fifteen. And I'm thinking, well, that's at halftime, fifteen minutes a quarter. So you're going to have thirty minutes of action in ninety odd minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What kind of game is that? Well, yeah, it's going to wear heading. <laughs> the thing is, wasn't it like that in 1983, Peter? Was it? <laughs> Certainly wasn't. No, I mean you you well, were no. running all I, those big supporting lines and linking here and I, there. And, oh goodness! I, th I think the game, you know, the the game. I, I guess they've changed the the laws over the last sort of twenty odd years to try and make the game more attractive and make it um, and with well faster. Um, and they haven't achieved it, I don't think. I mean, the game, you know, the game is attractive. I still enjoy watching it, but um, yeah. but um, you know, they don't get too many sort of nine six, you know, battles that we used to have in the old days. Um, You'd have loved the nine six, though, wouldn't you? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, but it wasn't a spec. It wasn't for the spectators in those days. It was the it was the game was for the players. Although but I watched Belgium beat Portugal ten six in the mud. The weekend before last, and that was as good a game as I've watched this season. It, was, they can be it was epic. It they was epic. Again. Did they have a TMO? Uh, they did have a TMO, but they didn't seem to use it much. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, I mean, the, you know, the the scrums now they take forever, don't they? And um, and 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 the TMOs. I mean, it, there's too many. You know, we we need to speed the game up, and at least try and speed the game up, and. Um, and and make it more entertaining and and you know and i guess you know you, you need to tire people out on the pitch which is the the sort of one of the 
but the 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 things that we used to try and do in the old days uh, is because the last 20 minutes of the game you would uh, you know things would open up people would be tired there'd be small space on the pitch um but that doesn't ha really happen now because um you know you bring another team on at half you know after 50 minutes you bring another sort of seven or eight players on you try and keep your opposite number on the field now wouldn't you peter uh, well i mean yes don't but establish too much I mean, superiority. They might take him off. But, you know, I mean, obviously people get injured, but I mean, uh, you know, to bring on, you know, have to the to bring on effectively potentially eight eight replacements seems, um, you know, a, a sort of negative move if you want the game to be entertaining in the last sort of 20, 30 minutes of the game. And they're all going six two splits on the bench, aren't they? Now, well, not not all, but but the well, Springboks no. have started it. The French have copied that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Yes, yeah, so, so so you know with the with the law changes and and then the substitutions, I think um, you know the get the game to me is not really going in the right direction. And uh, which you know, I mean, when you you talk talking about the scrummage and the scrummage put in earlier on, and Chris Chris was saying you know that that now it's tacitly sort of accepted that you basically put it in at the number eight speak, but actually that's not what they agreed. What they agreed was that the scrum half could take a half step now towards his own side yeah, feed and, on the the angle. Ball, yeah. And, and put the ball in straight that was the idea um unfortunately the people who decided on that law didn't realize that for a hooker to be able to actually strike for the ball it actually needs to go in the tunnel and not not so that he can't, he can't move his, his heel <laughs> backwards <laughs> not, so, not unless you're double jointed <laughs> That's right. So, I mean, talk it, it, when you talk about complete balls ups, you know, of 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 the laws and the way that things have been allowed to go. We talk. We've talked about the forward pass. We're talking about the devaluing of the scrum. This totally the the, the hookers art um, being you know significantly devalued. Lineouts again. You know, you look at the lineout again. You've got a partial throw. Because what's happening is, is it's traveling straight, but it's usually traveling straight, straight down a line that favors the side that is receiving the ball. Um, and, you know, it's again, it's it's become an area of almost no contest. In, in you know, five meter line outs, there are very few teams who are going to put players up to compete for the ball. You know, yeah, in fairness, you know, I mean, that, the reason they don't do that is because they've got to stop the drive. They've so got to defend fire the somebody up. You're going to struggle to uh, to stop it. But, but so but, they 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 cut their losses and say, well, we'll 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 we won't we'll fire it up. up. I yeah. mean, I, I think yeah, but I think if you you've got you know good line outs, I think they they can be very effective defensively, um, and make it very difficult for the opposition for the the, the team throwing in to get uh, good good quality ball. Um, I, and I think the island the island line out worked pretty well, and you know they they really uh, um, they made it very difficult for the Italians to to win any sort of line out ball at all. But one interesting, thing... interestingly, Peter, the last time I saw Tom Foley, who's uh, local to me in in Bristol, uh, who was a TMO in the World Cup final um, when Wayne was refereeing, the last the last time I saw him, he suggested that a very simple way of stopping the 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 almost inevitability of the the five meter drive the line out drive and and, the, and resulting in the kind of tries that Nick was describing earlier on in the conversation I agree with Nick about that they are quite dull things to uh, to watch um, is just to stop lifting in the line out mm. because yeah, well, then, then then the certainty of your ball is not such I suppose mm. that you can set yourselves in the way you would need to to have a very effective five metre drive in the way that let's say Exeter have it or or Bath at the moment have it because there are teams out there who almost never miss no there are some very efficient teams yeah but I I, I don't think it's going to go back to oh, no, 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 no. not suggesting for a, not suggesting for a second that it will happen but that was his automatic thought on it so that's quite a simple way of if you wanted to minimise that part of the game um, hey sorry it's, yeah. but it's quite interesting you know because what you see frequently with uh, particularly with five meter lineouts is that <clears throat> defending them is extremely difficult. It, it, it's hard. They usually result in tries and they usually result in tries because they'll almost always be penalized twice for offside in any 
line out defense that you know that goes on well so, the attacking side are all offside so, so the ball yeah <laughs> so, but the ball they get about 15 different chances to bloody well score because the the the, yeah. the five meter line out is just repeated and repeated until they eventually score you could you could certainly stop it if the bloke catching the ball in the line out wasn't allowed to feed it back he had to keep possession of it that, stop that it would, then that would be that would be that would make bring mauling back into the game in a big way yeah I think despite this conversation, to be fair, I think I saw a stat that said that in these first two rounds of the Six Nations, there have been the most lost lineouts in about seven or eight years. Well, that's because yeah. Italy have won three lineouts, I think. The Italian lineout is now Ruzza, but he's the only bloke to mark, and over the top to Brex. That's the only two moves yeah. they've got. It's got to be the easiest lineout in world history to pick off at the moment, the Italian lineout. Well, the, the France lineout's a mess as well. I think more yeah. of has hit about. A third well, that's because they keep on not picking any line edge jumpers. Well, that's that's also true. Yeah, they pick 150 kilo locks instead. <laughs> um, just on the subject of law changes, now France, Scotland, another farce in my view from it was the sort of the kick tennis that took place in the second half. And I think for people at home that don't quite understand how that law, it's not really a law, it's a loophole. And well, mainstream media is calling it the Dupont Law because it was discovered by Antoine Dupont at Toulouse and a lot of players, Finn Russell inclusive, have followed suit. So it basically denote, um, designates that players in an offside position after a kick has taken place don't actually have to go back until they are onside if they start more than 10 metres back from where the ball has come down. So as a result, what you saw on Saturday, it was a bunch of ridiculous kick tennis between Jalibert, Ramos, Russell, where each player would just stand absolutely static. Um, Peter, what do you make of that whole loophole? Do you think it's just one of those cases where a loophole has now been found and it's time to put a plug in it? Because it's, well, Scotland, France, we build it as the most exciting game of the weekend in the second half until they, they, it was dud. It was absolutely awful to watch. Yeah, well, clearly something something probably has to be done about it. Um, you know, it's uh, I mean, it's it's smart smart play from the French to, to work. You know, to to decide that's their their policy, but it's not. Uh, I mean, it's not good for the game, is it? It's not good for this for spectacle. Um, you know, I think you you should at least have um, players moving moving back until they're until they're put on side. So having to move back and and so somebody has to get in front of them and put them on side, um, otherwise yes, yeah, so otherwise we'll just get what we we had at the weekend. I mean, it is a sort of loophole, but at the same time, the reason it happens is that the kicker and the bloke next to the kicker no longer run forward, or when they decide, okay, we're going to do kick tennis now, they no longer run forward to put the players on side. Yeah. So it's an absolutely conscious decision. Yeah. From that, from the side to start off with, then it's a conscious decision from the team receiving. And I thought it was dull as hell by Scotland to do that. It completely played into France's hand. You know, Scotland are a, a counter-attacking team, a tempo team. They slowed everything down. And at the very least, you'd think you'd use the opportunity to bring some of your players back and get in position for the next counter-attack. I think I described it. It's like you get it's like having two or three free chess moves in a chess game. Mm -hmm. You can do that while this is going on. But well, they didn't even come up with that, Scotland. And, you know, I was um, I was annoyed at the TMO decision, but actually Scotland didn't deserve to win that match. No. They had they had the winning of that match entirely in their hands. They lost momentum there totally. And uh, I don't want to see that again on a, on a rugby pitch, that sort of quick tennis. It's 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 a big turn-off, and it doesn't make sense. Ben not, Russell was actually not... counting his steps, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not not in a showpiece event, you know. I mean, this is meant to be the uh, you know the gold standard of the game. Yeah, and it, I, it, I think it, it, it was 2016 when, as in Scotland, were 2016 down when Russell and Co were happy to engage in that. So I was going to highlight that, as you said, Brendan, that Scotland really they didn't take it to France enough, and you could say the decision was somewhat not karmic in that respect, but it certainly they like you say they didn't deserve to win the game. Yeah. The mindset was disappointing. Nick, Nick was absolutely right. I mean, leaving aside the, the, the stuff at the end with the TMO, they could have scored that try in 12 different ways. Yeah, hmm. yeah um, that's the other thing. Yeah. I mean, there was there was one, that uh, either either the penultimate or the pre-penultimate um, 
two inch drive towards the line. You actually saw Finn Russell walking. And, I mean, literally walking very slowly, organizing his backs, you know, behind the, you know, behind the 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 the, the forward activity on the line. Um, and you would have thought if you're down and you know it's the last play and what have you, you wouldn't just be ambling and vaguely waving your hands. At he, your had his back to the ball. he had his, he had his back, back to the ball. Exactly. He had his back to the ball, which is extraordinary. I mean, I know you. I know you assume you're going to get the ball back because you know it's a little, little, little bit difficult for the defending side, because because everyone plays differently in the last five minutes of the game anyway. Mm. As soon as they've lost possession, everyone defends differently. It's a no penalties defense, isn't it? Or else you're going to be five meters from your line, and we we know we know the problems. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I get rid of the game clock. I get rid of the bloody thing. I, I, I would not have players looking up from the pitch. I mean, the worst of it was people people just running down the clock while lining up a place kick. That was terrible. Hmm. That was terrible. And I would just, you know, back back when Peter was, was you know, was playing, um, well, certainly in the early part of his career, you, you'd ask the referee how long there is left and he'd say, well, what's it got to do with you? And you'd you, you, you play on um, until, I mean, you might sense that it might, this might be the last play, but that game clock gives a, a side far too much certainty and, and and allows them to game the system, basically. And I, I get rid of it. Got yeah. some Victor Meldrew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a positive outlook this episode. It's about to get a little bit worse, for at least a little bit, before we focus on the rugby side of things. And just while we're still semi on the subject of refereeing, I think the... The TMO decision in Scotland, France, and also a lot of the decisions we saw in England, Wales, are sort of emblematic of this zero flexibility approach that rugby appears to be taking with a lot of sides of the game. And the ones from England I have in mind are the George Ford kick, for obvious reasons, which we'll get to, the Mason Grady yellow card, and the Ollie Chesham yellow card. Now, the George Ford kick, there appeared to be zero tolerance for any movement whatsoever, whether it was an approach or not. Mason Grady had about minus half a second reaction time to try and catch the ball. And Ollie Chesham, there was absolutely zero impact to the head until you slow it down. And then, all, of course, when it's in slow motion, it's going to look like a, a, a much more dangerous tackle than it was. Um, yeah, so, Peter, what do you make of the sort of zero flexibility approach that appears to be to these sorts of decisions where it's either 100% or 0% by the sounds of things. Well, yes, it is. And uh, I mean, certainly the, um, I, I don't, I mean, the George Ford one is, is quite peculiar because, you know, wh wh whether he was, he, he wasn't actually a, approaching the ball when he took that step that, that, you know, he, he I guess he saw it as, uh, um, as just uh, um, another sort of readjustment before he, he then picks the the, the the goal. So it was a shoulder twitch, wasn't it? Well, it as, was, much, as much as anything. It was, I mean, I, I don't know. Looking at George Ford in the the, the, the past, I, I don't know how many times he's done that before. Or it, it, He's pretty routine, he's pretty clock-like. He, he lines it up straight. And all that, and his last preparation move is two steps to the left. You know, he's around the corner kicker. Then he comes to a halt, and then he approaches the ball. So I thought it was pretty clearly the, the wrong decision. Um, you know, the, the, he had not approached the ball until you know he was standing still, and he got charged, and he was about to approach the ball. Well, he's got to prepare for a kick as he wants. I mean, bloody Dan Bigger is never still at any moment. <laughs> and you know, um, Dan Johnny Wilkinson. Oh, I, I think the the mantra, I uh, think there has. To be a bit of leniency doesn't that i mean you know we we don't want uh the incidents like the george ford uh, incident because it, it because it's petty it's yeah. I'm like well come on just you know send them back and have another go and, and and that's probably what would have happened you know years ago but now the referee seems compelled to um you know to to make a decision and that's final and um and so off we go i mean you know the the mason grady one i i, I think you know okay it, could he, could, you know, was he trying to catch the ball? It didn't, to me, it didn't particularly look like it. And um, and I think he probably got, you know, he, he didn't have any choice. He was going to, if he was going to stop that try, he had to do, he had to actually 
do something to stop it. And he wasn't going to tackle the man because he was in the wrong position. So he, he went to try and, I guess, try and intercept it. And, um, which, which was what he probably never on. So, you know, that's why he went to the bin. And I don't think that's, you know, I think he, he, he must've known that at the time or, as you know, as, not saying as it, as it happened, but, you know, looking at it, he must, he must've uh, agreed with this decision. So, Right. Only, to my honesty, didn't really see that. So, I I enjoy that you mentioned Dan Bigger, Brendan, because Dan Bigger was actually one to say that it was <laughs> absolutely the correct decision. The irony of it, the irony of it was absolutely extraordinary. I mean, you know, he's he's moving for ninety nine percent of his. But I will say to Dan Bigger, there comes a point when he goes still, and that is yeah. just before he starts his approach. And that's how it is with kickers; they all have their idiosyncratic. You know, Owen Farrell does this really weird sort of manoeuvring with his eyes. You know, yeah. he's, he's constantly moving. After he's set himself, he does this scanning thing. Well, that's what he likes to do. That's how he gets it, everything lined up. And then he starts his approach. I mean, we're overcomplicating things. It, it's rugby smart ass mentality. There's a law there. We must try and game it. We must try and break it. And actually, it seems like this is a New Zealand bylaw, this, because the two refs who have given these in the last six months have been Kiwis. And in fact, both of them were at Twickenham on Saturday. And I was reading somewhere that it, this this did appear in a NPC game last year. And, it, and, you know, this charge was allowed. And that's where it seems to have come from. But no, you know, <laughs> it's not something that needs refing like that. Just let them. We all know what a genuine charge is. And it very, very rarely comes off. But if it does, fair play. But that wasn't that wasn't a fair charge. And it was a nonsense decision. Yeah, totally agree, Brendan. It was a Super Rugby game, wasn't it? It was the it might be a Super Rugby uh, game, yeah. The clarification came about, and that was when World Rugby. I can't remember exactly what the charge then was, but there was clarification asked, and World Rugby then said that the approach included the kicker moving in all directions. Which and, and here's where we are in the game now. Halfway, just after this incident, Don Rumbles, known to all of us, the hardworking press officer of World Rugby, had to put out the latest law clarification yeah. on the kick, which was clarifying the other latest law clarification on the charge and kick, because nobody bloody knows what even the pros, the world's best players, hadn't really come across that before. It's just ridiculous. I'd like some clarification on what world rugby is actually for. But that's another issue. <laughs> I actually think this whole thing was premeditated by the Wales team, to be honest. I yeah. think I th I think they'd study They'd had a look at his yeah. at his kicking routine. Oh that that's what that's Warren all over. There, yeah. There's no yeah, way be, that be, all 15 be, be, of them charged be, be. in <laughs> such an ambiguous incident, you know. And even like you remember James O'Connor um, being charged down by Peter Stringer when Stringer was playing for oh. the Buffaloes. It was just Peter Stringer that that went because O'Connor put his arm out, put it across his body, and apparently that included that designated approaching the ball. Stringer thought, "All right, I'll have a pop at this. It's a Barbar's game." Where it, and he was the only one that moved. I mean, it, it, it's interesting because of the move. it's interesting because Ford's sideways is his sideways move before he goes to kick is probably <laughs> just about in the direction of the, of the ball, and it's obviously been spotted by Gatland, and he's and he's you know they've 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 gone after it immediately. So oh, here's what, the other what, ridiculous what, what, thing. What, what, does he do it? He doesn't do it for every kick, does he? I don't know. I don't know. Well, I've, I've never noticed it before. And I mean, but then you 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 charge it because there's no penalty if you charge it. Yeah. You're not penalised for charging, even if you're charging when it's wrong. Yeah. Except you're not allowed to charge the next one. Once you do one charge, you can't do any charge at all. But here's yeah. the absolute nonsense of it. Even if you accept for a second that you can somehow interpret the law like that. Nobody actually checked to see see whether the Welsh guys actually did go before he even did this first movement, as no. indeed happened with Cheslin Colby. Nobody checked no. whether he went early or not when he charged down Ramos. No, absolutely. That, that's absolutely right. That's the decision absolutely. was given straight away. Well, if it's going to be that close, you have to check it. Oh, you God. Know? Oh, God, no. Because then the TMO will say it was all right, and then he'll say it wasn't. <laughs> and we'll, we'll all be back to square. Well, right. To be honest, I mean, I think most coaches are like this. Maybe not the very honourable man from Isha, who, who would rise above such skullduggery. But Warren, certainly, um, you know, I obviously know pretty well. Um, he's, he, he has a whole list of things. 
the, a, a ba basically little little chance of things you know you, we might be able to get away with this i spotted this try this we might be able to get get away with this it's pretty much cost free and he's he's very good at identifying those those little quirks and if you want to call that gaming gaming the game then he's gaming the game but it's uh, he won't be he won't be alone in all of this but he is particularly good at it well, I think he needs all the help he can get at the moment, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, well, I mean, people are banging on about the England, you know, England, England, this, that, and everything else. And uh, on man for man, that must be the weakest Welsh side I have ever seen. Yeah, that's a pretty high bar, Chris. Um, just going back to the early nineties, but um, <laughs> what the I mean, weakest? I, 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 I can't remember the. I can't remember the starting lineup when they lost about ninety six nil in South Africa that day, and um, and I, I think it was Arwell Thomas came off the bench. He was the last man off the bench, and the and 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 the uh, and, and the ever welcoming James Dalton, the Springbok hooker, said to him as he walked on, and Wells were ninety odd down by this point. Said, "Hey, China, you must be a seriously shit player to be on the bench for this lot." Nice man. The old great guy, but but the but the point is that is it's a. I mean, I think Wales are playing a, above their paper selves, if that makes sense. If you look at the side, you think, goodness gracious, that's well, yeah, really, hey, 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 really. Chris, hang on, if of the two teams, the team that played the most fluent attacking rugby, there wasn't a hell of a lot of it out there. But the team that played the most fluent attacking rugby was Wales. Well, that, that's the point. That's the point I'm making. There, there, there's a there's a there's a, there's a sort of bit of momentum of enthusiasm behind England at the moment, having beaten Italy down there. Okay, uh, Italy often play their best game in the first game of the tournament, and 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 everything sort of goes downhill from there. But but to win on your backsides against that Welsh side is not a cause for celebration, I would say. When it's, it, it, what 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 it, what was what's been your sense of the development of the, this England side since the. Uh... Since the World Cup, um, when obviously they finished third, um, in, in in a way, um, what what are your thoughts about about you know how how they're developing and 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 whether you know whether they've got much you know much of a chance at Murrayfield? Um, I, I look, it, it's you know we we're always desperately trying to to see the positive side of of English rugby. Um, I mean, in the last sort of 18 months, or well, certainly leading up to the World Cup and, and during the World Cup, it was it was pretty negative stuff, wasn't it? Um, you know, and 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 they they claim that they have um, changed the mindset. They claim that they're now going to be looking to move the ball and to try and play a, an all court game of rugby. Um, and it, it's certainly, you know, from what they were doing previously. It's very difficult to then suddenly change and start uh, playing, you know, the, the way Ireland do. Um, you know, it does take time. I mean, England do have some um, some good some good young players, um, and I, and I think, you know, eventually, if they are, you know, actually true to the, to their word that they are trying to develop the game, then then it will probably happen. Um, I, I don't see it happening fast enough to to go up to Murrayfield and, and beat Scotland. And that's, you know, it's not something I would like to say, but, but we, we're going to, we're going to struggle up there. I think, I mean, Scotland have certainly got, you know, they've played some, some good rugby. They don't have quite the resources that England have, um, but they do play a good game and, um, and they, they've played some very good rugby over the last sort of couple of years. And, um, uh, you know, but as I say, I think England do have some some good players, some very exciting young young players, and um, uh, I think they've they've got to you know be given their chance or given time to to develop. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, people like Cunningham South coming in, mm. he's one that one for the future. You know, people like, I mean, I I, I like this guy Tom Pearson from Northampton, and I'm surprised that he hasn't been given a shot. Um, you know, there's people like obviously Marcus Smith, but Finn Smith. Um, you know, and th there's some exciting boys in in the England setup. At, at, uh, you know, but it, it's a. I guess they've just got to um, to really, and maybe not talk about playing good rugby so much as just do it. It's interesting, isn't it, with with Borthwick's <laughs> mindset 
you you lose a player as as influential as Tom Curry, and it's I mean that does appear to be I mean he's in, in the papers today saying I don't know when I'm going to play again. Um, you know he's he's turned down the metal hip option, um, thinking that it was it will be he's a bit too young to have a metal hip, but he's by no means he doesn't sound very confident from what I could from what I could glean that he's going to be back anytime soon. So having lost him. Uh, it's interesting that Borthwick has gone back to somebody like Underhill, who's got a whole history of problems himself, fine player though he is, um, rather than someone that Peter, I mean, I agree with Peter completely on that. This bloke Pearson's on the crest of a wave at the moment. Um, and he's 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 very powerful. Um, very, very good on the carry. You know, pitch coverage is high. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I would have thought he might have been the more positive choice, but I just think I just think England England to get England going into a side as they did against the box in the semi final as heavy underdogs. I think they can make themselves very difficult to beat, but whether they can really really exert their authority on sides um, that maybe aren't scaring them into a heroic defensive performance. I don't know. I think it would be easier for them to lose narrowly to someone like the All Blacks or the Springboks than to go to Murrayfield and win. And keep in mind, they were more than happy to play zero rugby against the Springboks in the semi-final, whereas if they decide to do the same thing against Scotland, it goes against this whole this whole Basel recreation era. Well, I mean, we, we I mean, remember how much trouble they gave Ireland as well last year in the Grand Slam match, right? And, and, until the stewards sending off. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying England were on course to win that game, but they were being a right old pain um, to a, to a very high perform against very high performing yeah. opponent. But, but I honestly think that um, <laughs> you know that if England if England say right, okay, we're going to change the way we really are going to change the way we play, and we're going to try and develop our game, you know, and and I and I look at at Ireland as and Ireland and probably New Zealand are the two sides in the world at the moment that really do play a, an intelligent um, all court game. They move the ball very well. They create all sorts of pictures for the defence, and it changes all the time. Um, and and I think if England want to do that, then that they and they honestly mean that, then then I think you know ultimately it could could benefit the the, the game um, and the way they play because you know I was listening to I think it was Jamie George who who said you know we want to put smiles on people's faces at Twickenham and absolutely because people at Twickenham have not had smiles on their faces for an, a couple of years well a number of years now. And and there's two ways of doing that. You either win the game, so you can either go back to your kicking game and 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 and, and less risk, um, or you can play an attractive style of rugby and get the ball moving and get the ball into people's hands who can can light the pitch up, um, or do both. Um, you know, but um, you know, I, I don't see the upside in in just trying to grind out you know, wins by one or two points. You know, it's we've got to be a bit more ambitious than that. I think we've still got a, a bit of a conundrum over Alex Mitchell because the first 50 minutes we got the England Alex Mitchell and he was sort of deferring to George Ford on the tactical front of that. And then about 50 minutes in, and I'm sure he'd got the word that he was off in 10 minutes and Danny Kerr was coming on, he, we got the Northampton Alex Mitchell. And he started playing off the cuff, diving around, up the tempo. It was just like watching the film you know, fast forward. And suddenly England did start to pick up, you know, going into that final quarter uh, and began to start playing quite a bit better. So if you're going to have Alex Mitchell, let's have the Northampton Alex Mitchell for the full 80 minutes. I don't see... It's quite odd, isn't it? Because England normally, number 10 calls the shots. Whereas we've got a scrum half there who's a bit more like a French scrum half. He's he, he's the guy who makes Northampton tick there. And uh, I think we, we've got to give him his head a bit more. So what you're saying... And in, in, in another way of saying it is that it's a pretty pres prescriptive game plan. Yes, yeah, I feel that every well, very often with Mitchell, he, 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 he only at the end as a sort of hail mary does he go to his Northampton natural style. Normal game, basically, and he always he looks much better. It. And England always pick up when he does that. Now, one or two of the England players aren't quite on the same page at the moment, so you know there, he did make a few little darts, and there wasn't people there and that, or they weren't reading him. But that is the way forward. He no, spends a lot longer in his shell in an England shirt than he does. He it? does, yeah. And, and I know there's the whole comfort zone and the familiarity. You know, I yeah. mean that that's why international rugby is a big step up. I dare say, but it's um, 
Uh, I, th I think that's true in Mitchell's case in particular. It is noticeable that he's he's a slightly diminished version of himself. Which, how, how, difficult, how difficult is it for for players? Do you think? And you, you know, you you know, you've been in the test arena for a, a very long time. It was a, a while ago. But how how difficult do you think it, it is for players to actually, um, if they've got a fairly prescriptive uh, game plan from coaches to actually depart from it. How difficult! I would have thought very difficult. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because you're putting your whole, you're, you're putting your your. If it doesn't work, you're putting your uh, your, your your test career in jeopardy. Yeah, but, well, yeah, yeah. You, but uh, you know, you, within within the game plan, I think play, you know you don't pick a player because he's got he's got flair and try and you know uh, try and stop that flair. You know, you 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 pick players because of what they can do, yeah. um, not necessarily what you want them to do. But uh, so you know, someone like Mitchell should have, you know, he should have free reign and to to be able to make his own decisions at certain certain times on the pitch. I mean, you know, he's one of the the main decision makers anyway. Him and 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 um, George Ford. So, um, you know, so so I think, uh, you know. You, you, if you want to play a, a, a fast or a sort of game where the the ball is moving, you, you 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 and you need skillful players to open up the game, then if you, you let them do that, you know, don't don't like try and rein them in. Let them do it. I mean, it's like, it's like when you saw Wales in that second half against Scotland. I mean, some of the the rugby was fantastic. Suddenly they were they were they were had the freedom to to do you know to to get that ball moving and take chances, and um and I think you know England have got very talented players and and they've got to be given their head, and they've got to be given their chance to get to um, you know to show to show what they can do and 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 so the the game plan as such has got to change to allow players like that to to thrive. Yeah. Did you feel Peter when you were playing in in Jeff Cook's side? Um, and and then subsequently in the, with the ninety three Lions, I, I mean Rob Andrew was always a fascinating figure, wasn't he? Because every, everyone everyone knew that Rob could play some football if he, you know, he he, he could he could trip the like fantastic a bit. I mean you saw him do it. I mean a vast team actually saw him do it do it for wasps on on many occasions. But he was all he was always accused of being the. Um, um, uh, the, the 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 master of the of the of the ten man game or the restricted game or whatever it was, and I just wonder from an insider what you how you how you squared the fact that Robu could play some very extravagant rugby if he so chose um, wasn't that oh. extravagant in an England side. Well, I think when you've got Carling and Guskett and Underwood outside you, you know you're not the star of the show, are you? You let them do it. So. <laughs> So you know, it was a question of of being that link um, and and organising the game, but uh, you know he didn't need to. Mm. Just had to you know make sure that they got the ball when they wanted it. So you so you don't think that the, the Rob Andrew Stuart Barnes contest was the absolute equivalent of the George Ford Marcus Smith or Owen Farrell Marcus Smith um, contest. No, uh, no, I don't think so. I think you know, and I, you know, if you if you played for Bath, you thought the Barnsley should play, and if you didn't play for Bath, then you thought Rob should play. And there were a lot more who didn't play for Bath than did. Yeah, yeah. So, no. we'll leave it at that, shall we? <laughs> Forgive and forget, Peter. <laughs> I've got to be careful because Barnsley's wife uh, Leslie is my my daughter's god godmother, so we've got to be careful on this one. <laughs> oh well, I'll give him a ring in a minute and just tell him you sold him straight down the river. Okay, Is that yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever. Just before we, um, you, well, listeners of the Rugby Paper Podcast will know me and my stats. Just before we move on from England Wales, just for some stats for the two of them. So the BBC threw up a graphic about England's attack, um, and compared to the first two games of Six Nations 2023, where well, England weren't exactly playing much rugby either. We've scored fewer tries, made uh, made fewer carries, fewer meters made, fewer points per attacking twenty two meter entry, and a lower ruck speed, um, on average, and, few, and fewer line breaks, and fewer line breaks. No, I think line breaks is the one that we're ahead on, actually. Oh, right. um, are, are, are the wise okay? 
<laughs> <laughs> but I think I think this is this is just a sign. Look, you know, clearly England haven't done what they sort of have set out to do and what they said they would do. And it's like, don't don't try and pull the wool over people's eyes and the supporters' eyes and stand there and go, you know, we're okay. we're playing good rugby now, we're doing this and it well, well clearly they're not. So you know, just be honest about it and go, well, we haven't achieved what we wanted to achieve, but, you know, we're going to try to. We're going to still keep going. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, don't don't talk about it, just do it. I think their insistence on picking someone like Elliot Daly when obviously the midfield is stretched and we know that because Lawrence and Tuolangi have been sidelined. But Elliot Daly, for example, there was a one-on-one he had to score a try in the corner. I can't remember who tackles him in the end. Maybe it was Josh Adams. And to be honest, he got absolutely nowhere near scoring the try. And I couldn't help but thinking if you'd had someone along the lines of a Faye Waboso or a Radwan or something like that, who might be able to produce a little bit of something out of nothing, then England may have not left it to be a two-point game or something like that. So I think England's insistence on picking some players, despite what they're saying, but just don't align with it, is very much a determiner in how much attacking rugby they're actually playing. Moving on to a stat about Wales, they went 101 minutes without conceding a penalty between round one and two, which I just thought deserved a bit of a shout out because I thought that was very, very impressive. They conceded four penalties in round one and also very few in round two, but there was a 101 minute gap um, between the second half of round one and the second half of round two. So I thought that was worth a little mention. Chewy, I know you. Oh, think- I mean, that is an extraordinary yeah. stat. Um, yeah. um, Wouldn't have done that with Richard Moriarty playing. Yeah, uh, you can look at it two ways. That could you could argue they're not quite getting involved enough at the breakdown, but but discipline is discipline, and you know, they're not giving away uh, kickable penalties during that period. So you can only applaud it. Well, yeah. well they are getting involved in the breakdown, Bren, because well, they- Raphael well, does. Yes, but know, the other Raphael played out of his skin. Yeah. Yeah, and and he yeah, he's the absolute exception, and he, and he's a very very sort of textbook jackler. But there wasn't much else going on there, was there, from the um the the back row in terms of jackling and 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 loose ball. And you know they're they're not the only team. There's not much of it going on with France either at the moment. No, Who, yeah, who's their jackal? Aldrich. He's on the bench, Marshawn. <laughs> Marshawn, yeah. Yeah, um... you're making it very. If you do not give away penalties, you're making it difficult for the opposition. Um, there's, I think, I think it's an incredible stat that to go 100 minutes without giving away a penalty. I mean, if you, you know, we always talk about discipline and and what it means on the pitch, but that that's uh, that stat is incredible. So I think you know, hats off to Wales. And I mean, you, you know, you bring you bring that sort of discipline to the party, and uh, you know, ultimately you, you're going to be a difficult side to beat. You'd, um, you'd, you'd have thought they'd at least given a, a couple away at, at scrum time, wouldn't you? But I mean, yeah. uh, you've got a couple of kids at prop and, and what have you. So they've done particularly well there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Remarkable. And I'm presuming it coincides with the 26 straight points they scored in the second half in Scotland. Oh, 100%, and yeah. the first half against England. What was the score at halftime? 14-8, um, I think. 14 yeah. five. So, you know, it, it also stacks up that they that period of discipline was their best period statistically on the scoreboard yeah they're, they're 40 points to five up against scotland and england in that time period so. well that's a pretty that is a good that's an extraordinary stat yeah so that's pretty damning in two games that they obviously ended up losing yeah um so no that's well i thought that was an interesting one to throw out there um, the only that's about the first stat i've ever enjoyed that's quite interesting <laughs> <laughs> that's improved my success rate a little bit are you a stats driven coach peter no <laughs> <laughs> Peter's going to go to Isha tonight and just rule out penalties completely. <laughs> well, well, we only gave away seven at the weekend, um, so that was that was good. A nice change. Pretty good. <laughs> a nice change. What's the average? I guess you wouldn't know. Oh, God, we've been giving away sort of 14, uh, 15 penalties um, per match over the last few games, and, you know, but we've managed to change it, which is good. But they've all been conceded for the best possible motives, haven't they? Well, I didn't agree with a lot of them, but uh, that's the, me and the referee. But uh, nah, it's uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's 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 a difficult one because you know there's no doubt that when you you know as Wales have done when you when you don't give penalties away like that, it, it's it really you are making it very difficult for the opposition. I mean, you you know you, even if you're not jackaling or or trying to cause trouble in the breakdown, you know 
you, you the opposition have still got to have still got to play and have still got to take chances and have still got to try and um and and score points and obviously through that hundred minutes Wales did a hell of a job uh, you know for you know for 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 what you've described as one of the worst Welsh sides ever um you know they they are young and I think that they they they're, they're going in the right direction yeah yeah. yeah. If so start are, eating, like, eating your words. Well, yeah. I, 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 I think my point was that, that when you looked at the side on paper, you it looked incredibly weak. But I think they performed, and I also added that they performed well above themselves. I think, or, or the, well, well above anyone who made that judgment, which I have and I stand by. <laughs> Disappearing, Dan. Even, even though I've been shown to be a complete. Frat who doesn't know the first thing of what he's talking about. So thanks everyone for making my evening. <laughs> Just on points conceded, a uh, penalties conceded. That was where Ireland started to get it together. What was it eight years ago, seven or eight years ago? Remember they when they beat the blacks in Chicago? Yeah. They conceded three penalties that day. And they sort of averaged three or four penalties per test match. Um, well, that, that is pretty much their average ever since. Um, so that is an absolute rock solid base from which a side can improve and sort of launch forward. Yeah, I think Maro Itoje um, is starting to lead a reduced penalties in England camp. I think he gave the side a target of being below seven, which is quite ironic. Personally, based, you're based, based, based on his penalties, that leaves the rest of the team the room to give away about one or two. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, he's uh, Brendan <laughs> mentioned him last week. He, he's he's beginning to look something like again. Yeah, he is. Um, it's because he got there. Come out of the, he's come out of the foothills and he, he's he's on his way up the top of the mountain again. He's, I think he's terrific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was certainly one of England's more impl- impressive players. Yeah. I mean, we haven't mentioned Ben Earl, obviously, who most people are saying if you could make up an uh, Six Nations fifteen out of one player fifteen times, it would be him. Well, um, compared to those blokes in the Super Bowl, he's a trappist, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, 100%. Um, Chu, I'm going to ask you to put your shovel down uh, regarding Wales, and we'll move on from Wales. Wince, do you need to get going? Yeah, I've got to go, actually, Ollie, I'm afraid, chaps. Oh, absolutely fine, yeah. of course. Yeah, I, I was just about to say, forgive me for not mentioning. Uh, yeah, well, thank you very much for joining us, Peter. Lovely. Um, all the best for the right, John, Good to see you again. Thanks. Good. Cheers, chaps. See you, see you quickly. Thanks, Peter. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, so I'm going to just put what well, I'm going to play devil's advocate and sort of poke a tiger with a stick. Since Ireland have been so dominant these past two weeks, I've just seen discussion around bumping them, promoting them from the Six Nations to the Rugby Championship. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> you just um, did that come from the Southern Hemisphere by any chance? I actually I don't know where I saw it to be honest. I just saw a few tweets and a, a few tweets saying exactly the same thing. Well, uh, look, I, I I I was I was astonished at the at the at the completeness if that if that's a word of their performance in Marseille. Um, I, I wouldn't have put a penny of the money I don't have on Italy giving them any trouble at all in in Dublin last weekend. They're they're an out, they're an outstanding side playing a pr- a pretty irrepressible brand of rugby, and um, you know I did a piece last weekend saying the big game of the year the big game of the year for me without any shadow of a doubt is Ireland New Zealand in Dublin in November I, I for, so partly for the reasons that Peter mentioned during the conversation that they're the two sides who are playing the all court game. It's ridiculous to dismiss the Springboks from the discussion of who's the best side in the world, but they do <laughs> tend to turn up at World Cups and be, you know, sort of in and out in the interim, which is fine. It's the way they're set up. With all their, there's so many of their players playing abroad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Ireland and New Zealand, with all their with all their similarities in structures and, and attitudes and governance and all that kind of thing, uh, but more than anything else, they just play rugby that puts you on the edge of your seat a bit. They're 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 tremendous, and t- I mean a lot of people are speaking about McCarthy, and I get it. Tyburn is off the scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jack Crowley, I mean nobody's mentioned Sexton anymore. Jack Crowley is a no. major talent. He is a major talent. He's going to be around for a long, long time, barring injury. 
uh, and it's seamless, absolutely seamless. He stepped yeah. in. Uh, end of last season, he was winning the uh, URC with Munster. He, he was winning it for him, and now he's gone straight in the Ireland team and looks to the man of born. Yeah. yeah. Nobody it, no, nobody in this sport ever wants to get too far ahead of themselves, I don't think. You know, injuries yeah. count for a hell of a lot. Um, what interests me about them and uh, a comparison between them and other teams is, and, and not, not Gatland's Wales, because... You know, he, he has to make do and mend all the time and bring players through. And I think he does a really good job of it, Warren. But um, you take a guy like James Lowe and you look at how he's improved as a player, um, you know, in, in this Ireland squad over the last sort of three three years. And it's a quantum leap, you know. Yeah. And, and that's what's really interesting is, is that where they set the bar and what their standards are and how many good players they're bringing through so that the transition seems you know about as seamless as it can as it can get at the moment but you know look the thing about being you know on the pedestal is is that everybody's looking to knock you over there's only one way you can go <laughs> uh, yeah and and so you know I, I it doesn't look at the moment as if there's anybody um now that they've seen off the french in the first game and france look like a shadow of, um, of 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 the team that built into the 2023 World Cup, it doesn't look as if anybody in the Six Nations has got the wherewithal. So I sort of take the the um, the 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 jive about them joining <laughs> joining the Rugby Championship, um, but uh, because they probably you know they they'd find it much tougher. Um, but is there a suggestion but, that they play in that as well? No, yeah. in, in why not? Yeah, I mean, they're actually oh, a bit of a colonel. Might as well have a handicap. Yeah, why not? <laughs> At the same, move the rugby. That means some of their best players will have to play more and get twelve games a season. Yeah. Well, they yeah, can I'll tell you what, take it one further and move the rugby championship to the same point in the calendar at the Six Nations. Yeah. And get well, Ireland playing a Saturday and a Sunday game every single weekend. Well, they've got two teams, haven't they? I mean, yeah, I was going to exactly. say they, they could play they, their they A team win. in one in the it, in Six Nations and they'd uh, still win the Six Nations with their B team. Nick is right to be a bit cautious, though. There was a big debate on Twitter at the weekend: is this the best ever Six Nations team, Ireland? No, and, and it's not. England to England. Not only did they obviously win two thousand and three, they went fourteen games undefeated against the Southern Hemisphere, and they won the World Cup. Yeah. So in that context, Ireland, wonderful team that they are to watch, uh, exhilarating. Um, they're still a bit, they're some way short in achievement. So yeah. as Nick says, you have to it, just be a little bit patient before Look, you know, anointing them as the greatest. Let's, let's, let's not, again, let's just bloody well look at what the, what the ledger says. You know, they played New Zealand in a semi-final. They are the last team to have beaten... South Africa, having said that, yeah. in the pool stages, but they played New Zealand in the semi final. It was a knife edge oh, game, but quarter they final, quarter final, final. They've never reached a semi final. No, in a quarter final, and they lost yeah. it. So, you know, they, but it's the way that they've hit the ground again, you know, not just running, but bloody sprinting that has been yeah. really, really impressive. Yeah. Um, and the only side that I, you know, the only side really, um, well, we've got the we we the, I are they against um, Scotland in? They've got Wales. Yeah, they have Wales. Scotland at home in the last game. They've yeah. got Scotland at home, so that could be. Yeah, you'd have to favour them, uh, but they've got England at Twickenham, yeah, so England good. are the only side. But I mean, at the moment, I just I'm afraid unless England were to beat Scotland and really pick up. In the second half of the Six Nations, I couldn't see them troubling Ireland. You, you can, you can sort of see England uh, if, if things go their way at Twickenham. You can sort of see them being sort of hanging around like a bad smell in that game in the last ten minutes. Mm. And 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 then, of course, anything could happen. But you still, you still wouldn't back them because Ireland are, uh, are very good at managing games at the death. Leaving aside the the game you mentioned um, at the World Cup. Um, they they they're not giving too many suckers an even break at the moment. Either. Not at all. They're yeah. scoring a lot of tries, and they're also preventing other people from scoring too many. And they, you know, Italy didn't look like scoring a try. And this is with one or two of their star turns just a little bit off from where they were. I mean, Van der Fleer isn't quite the player he was when he won the the World Player of the Year. That's not to say he won't get back, but 
you, you know, uh, how long is Ty Furlong going to be there? Um, Omani's already said pretty much in terms that he's not going to get to another World Cup. So where is the, where's the transition at blindside? They, 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 I don't know how old, Gibson, how old is Gibson Park? I don't know, but he looked ages. But... He, he was even just on that match on Sunday, which was a pretty ho hum, nondescript from from Italy. Really business like from Ireland. He comes on and he lights the place up. He, yeah. He's playing a different game. I mean, how the Kiwis miss him, I do not know. They don't. He gives a tremendous amount of tempo to it, doesn't he? Oh, he's a player. He's a yeah. player. Yeah, he, he is. he's thirty. Uh, he's thirty-one, by the way. So, well. Yeah. Okay. You know, Aki is, Aki is no, you know, obviously no spring chicken. I mean, he he looks no. Big. But by the next World Cup, he'll be Danny Care's age or younger than Danny Care was at the last World Cup. So oh, I've got Gary Ringrose and Henshaw. That's pretty rough, isn't it? But yeah. but they're but as Nick said, their production line is good at the moment. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's yeah. really strong. And 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 the discussions that we were having on this podcast with people like from people from people the people up north like Willie Anderson and and Stephen Ferris. Who was sort of saying, well, this Leicester dom this Leicester domination, Leinster rather domination, is all well and good, but there's trouble down the road. But since those discussions, of course, Munster have come through, have, have, have sort of gone back up a few rungs and they yeah. won themselves a title and they're producing some players who are in the Ireland starting lineup. Mm -hmm. So so actually things on that front it, it, uh, are, are a little better than perhaps we thought they might be a few months ago. I mean, one of the most, again, you know, one of the, the, the disappointments, and it is something that you think that at some stage the Six Nations has got to get to grips with. You know, we've got Casada come in and, um, you know, obviously this, the, the, the Netflix full contact um, thing shows that, I mean, Crowley and Neil Barnes come across as two of the more entertaining characters in the, in the game. And um, but what Crowley did with uh, with Italy last season, the way he got their attack moving, was it, it gave the the Six Nations a little bit more of, of an edge. What I don't want to see this season, and the danger is, is that this happens after the beating that they got in Dublin, is to see them. You know, is to see it become a sort of you know, you're carrying a passenger right the way through the Six Nations. It's no good if if every weekend a third of the fixtures are devalued. It's well, just and, no and, good. And, and adding to that, and Brendan's already referred to it, Portugal and, and, and you know, we we had a, a podcast on this three or four weeks ago and there was a prediction, wasn't there? That yeah. Portugal, without access to all their players and without the kind of, kind of preparation time that they had ahead of the World Cup and without the Giske there they might not even beat Belgium no and hey that's Presso right, yeah. they didn't beat Belgium yeah. Francisco was right um, and that's and so you it's very very difficult without that carrot of a, uh, of a promotion where are those countries going to go seriously where are your Georgias and Portugals going to go it's yeah. Groundhog Day. You, I've been watching it all, all the Rugby Europe stuff. It's Groundhog Day for Georgia. That they like Ireland aren't even putting out their first team. Really, that, that, that it's a it's a mix and match fifteen. But it's just going through the motions. We can beat this lot. We can beat this lot. You know, we don't even have to work up a sweat. We can beat this lot. It There's makes you. It, it it really. I mean, if you talk about sort of seething cold anger that goes on and on and on, it's this lockdown. In, in rugby, you know, the refusal of, of nations to be prepared to be judged on a meritocratic basis. Yeah. It's Lock totally down the word, wrong. Nick. That's the word. It's, it's, it's very difficult. And, 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 and while cricket in many ways is every bit as conservative as rugby in governance and administration, um, and I, I, we are not comparing like we'd like, but sides like Bangladesh have been able to make very significant strides mm. in top level international cricket and not just in the Bish Bash stuff. You know, they play a decent level of, of test cricket now. And yes, test cricket's on its knees. And all, there's all sorts of, 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 of things wrong with the, the setup in cricket. But they've been more successful in introducing a little bit of new blood into the international, into the international setup. And, you know, in the end, the Six Nations is a closed shop. 
Yeah. End of story. Privately run, privately organized. I mean, it and... is, I mean the, the Portugal story <laughs> is the parable of our times, really, in, in, in that sense. You know, a few months ago, the whole of the you know, the game was enthused by what they did. Portugal, people in Portugal or the Portuguese oh. diaspora in France and so on and so forth, all over Europe were infused by the way in which their team played. Now what? You know. I think I think Francisco would be slightly um perturbed that I don't mention in their second game last weekend, they put a pile of points on Poland. Now they are using the opportunity of blood in a few new players. They have got a really hot young talent at nine. Played his, he made his debut. Hugo Camacho from Bayonne. He's mm -hmm. on the Bayonne staff, 19. He is lightning. And, you know, there are, it was slightly reassuring to know there is still talent, emerging talent there in Portugal. But it has to be given a chance. Who is their given... coach, Bren? Because no, we... I don't know. I, I couldn't gather who they, they've got this interim guy that um, Francisco was mentioning. I can't remember his name. It's, but they have uh, not got... Jose Paixio. Yeah. They have not got a coach in place. And... Yeah. You know, that is lethal at this stage, you know, coming straight off a really great World Cup for them. That is very unfortunate. Um, they've got a must-win game against Romania this week in Romania. If they do that, they get into the semi-final playoffs and they can get all, probably get all their bigger names back for, you know, a, a, a one match and semi-final playoff and possibly the playoff. Um, can I mention, we've been giving referees a bit of a shilling, but we need a word for Luke, Luke Pierce in Dublin. Two things... He's the only ref currently refereeing the neck roll. Um, Ireland, having talked about their discipline, did three neck rolls and he pinged them every time. There's a lot of neck rolls going on in the other games that weren't pinged. But most of all, Robbie Henshaw went in for a try. It was a bit of a scrambling on his knees job. Did he, did he, was he tackled, was he held? And he initially awarded it and then thought better of it. Went to, went to the TMO and insisted that the TMO replay the action in full speed. In, in live speed, was not interested in a slow motion, played it in live speed, saw the error of his ways, corrected his decision. And I just wish referees would make much more decisions on live, on full speed video instead of the artificial slow motion, which absolutely corrupts the, the picture and the scenario sometimes. Yeah. I'm with you. I think Luke Pierce is as good a referee as there is in the world. I think he's a very right good now, he's the best. I think he's a very good referee, but I cannot stand the constant consultative, you know, it sounds like a, 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 a just endless chatter. You know, I mean, he encourages it as well. You don't, I don't want to, he, you know, you don't want to hear every player giving his opinion on a decision and the referee sort of saying, well, no, you're not right, actually. It was this or that. It's just nonsense. So I'd say the need to brush up on that. of his game that he needs to bloody well attend no. to. It's yeah. not to be consultative about every single decision he makes. But it was his 50th test. So we should say congratulations to Luke Pierce um, because that Absolutely. is a, a great achievement. And, and he was unquestionably the referee of the weekend. He was. And, out. and, and, and to, it was a couple of seasons ago, possibly during, possibly during COVID. I can't, can't quite remember, but it, uh, there was there was there was a season or a big chunk of a season where he single handedly speeded rugby up. Yeah, yeah. He just said, "Get on with it," you know. While while scrum was were still able to stand there, and then the caterpillar rugby was very fashionable, and scrum was were standing there looking at the ball as though they were watching an egg poaching, you know. And and it was uh, he would he would just order them. Yeah. <laughs> Don't give him five seconds. Just tell him to crack on with it. And he was. I I think he's. I think he's. He's. Very good, and I, I I wish him all the best. We need all the good referees we can get. The Georgian guy's a good referee as well, by the way. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah well, we've mentioned him obviously. So hopefully he sticks around Luke for another fifty tests, and he he'll have Wayne Barnes's record in his side. Yeah, back. well, he's only twelve, isn't he? Yeah. So he's got he's got plenty of time ahead of him. <laughs> if he's only twelve, how old was he when he made his refereeing debut? Minus four. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, before we wrap up. Shall we run over the predictions league? Oh. <laughs> Should I be enthusiastic we'll about this? I'm getting a warm feeling. <laughs> well, we'll go in reverse order, Brendan. I like the sound of that. As 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 your groan suggests, you've fallen a little bit behind on 24 points. Um, 
your Scotland France result, which, like you say, was almost the prediction. Big asterisk on that. Big asterisk. I know, but it ended up being the only incorrect result prediction of the weekend. Uh, so you've obviously taken your hit. Nick, you're next up on 26. I'm in third on 30. Jiffy was the predictor of the weekend. Um, he got 19 points in total, which has bumped him above me into second on 30. Yeah, with a massive advantage because he was able to see the first week and not... But... It, ha it hasn't helped them in the first couple of years, so we're sticking with it for the moment. And But Chewy... I know you. You sound bitter, but you're in, you're you, you're the bitterest first placer ever. You're in you're in first with thirty four points. He knows it won't last. <laughs> I don't know. I've had a look ahead to his predictions for week <laughs> three, four, and five. They all seem pretty well more conservative than Wales to beat Ireland. Let's say that. It's not fair. He took it seriously this year. I'm not sure. I know. I know. Now. Well, he needed to remind us. Uh, that in that in fact, the opposite was true. I sweated like hell last year over those predictions and <laughs> crashed like some horse at Beecher's Brook at the very first fence. Yeah, I think you and Brendan have maybe swapped places this year. And 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 and, and my esteemed colleagues were in um, in no rush to stop banging on about it. In fact, they're still <laughs> on about it now. We didn't yeah. realize, you know, I did just bring it up. No, fair enough. Well, you won't be taking home the wooden spoon this year at this rate. Um at the very least. And if you can, that will shut me up for another year if you can take first place. Guys, we're recording with Brian Redpath next week. Obviously, we'll preview the big one in Murrayfield. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Yeah, brilliant. Good round. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Rugby Paper Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use and recommend the show to your friends. The Rugby Paper is available to buy every Sunday and to make sure you don't miss it, subscribe to our print, digital and online options at therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions. That's therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions to get all our content for as little as 14p per day. <laughs>